One of the things that I have noticed uh, uh, from a number of uh, Pentecostal authors, including yourself, um, and I think it might arise out of a concern that those who maybe were not part of the Pentecostal movement but had sympathy for it were concerned that the work of the Son and the work of the Spirit could be divided up. And I see recently that uh, in the past few years that Pentecostals have really been addressing that issue. Very much so. Uh, it, the, the relationship of the third article, if you will, with the other two is a, is a concern of Pentecostal theology because of some of the extremes and abuses that have arisen historically. And, uh, for example, with regard to the second article, I mean, uh, Pentecostalism has always had a strong focus on Jesus, but it has tended uh, historically to focus on the charismatic Christ, the one who conquers the forces of darkness through healing and other charismatic, charismatic manifestations of the Spirit, but not as much emphasis on, for example, the virtues or um, the ethical kinds of commitments that Jesus had, not as strong there in that area, mm -hmm. uh, more oriented toward the power than the purity. And uh, we've seen how that has been abused. For example, in the 1990s uh, uh, with these controversies over these televangelists and the kind of lifestyles that they were living, very charismatic figures who were powerfully gifted and yet who um, really uh, did not base that as strongly as they needed to on the sanctified life, almost like a kind of Samson figure whose destiny becomes unfulfilled because of the fact that this richly gifted man did not discipline his passions. So I, I see Samson as kind of a metaphor for me of what can happen when Pentecostalism does not uh, have an adequate Christological basis uh, for its pneumatology. Uh, in terms of the first article of the Creed, uh, this issue became very much um, a concern of mine during the uh, six-year dialogue that I participated in with the Reformed. Uh, it was an international Reformed Pentecostal dialogue that occurred. And one point they were pressing was how Calvin had strongly emphasized the first article, that all, you know, God the Father, the one who elects and creates, that all of creation is meant to become the, you know, theater of God's glory. And uh, it occurred to me during that dialogue that we Pentecostals uh, tended, because of our Christ focus, to view pneumatology almost exclusively in soteriological categories, that we were not taking adequately into consideration the creation motif. Um, and so this Holy Spirit tended to be viewed as solely a supernatural force that breaks into the natural order to redeem and transform, but not as that which nourishes life and gives rise to it and is present even in natural processes. Mm -hmm. So I felt that uh, we Pentecostals needed to do a better job of connecting the spirit, not only with the second article, but with the first. And it was really the Calvinists who brought that to my attention. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is an area where we Pentecostals are, are doing work. And that is, it's good that we have this emphasis on the third article. It's been a wonderful gift to the church and we've joined with others in doing that including the holiness folk, but it's time to really do a lot more work in how that connects with the second and first articles. You know, it's very interesting that uh, in, in Wesley's day, with his emphasis on the Holy Spirit, uh, an emphasis that uh, John Fletcher particularly yes. picked up, John Fletcher, who was Wesley's designated successor. And I've appreciated your work in this area. Thank you, thank you. and. Um, Fletcher is a young man uh, who also had a great deal of influence over another very important uh, leader in Wesley's movement was Joseph Benson. And Joseph Benson uh, had great admiration for Fletcher. And Fletcher began to develop this aspect that he found in Wesley, particularly as a result of, of uh, what Wesley had to say about the Holy Spirit and Pentecost as a result of his going to Hernhut and talking with Christian David is where he really came up with this very strong idea of a difference between justifying faith and full sanctifying grace. 
And Fletcher picked up on that and began to develop it more consistently than he thought Wesley had done so. At one point, Wesley wrote him a letter, or not, not didn't write Fletcher a letter, but told him, you've got to be careful that you don't separate the spirit from the word who is Christ. And Fletcher wrote uh, a letter to the young Benson at the time, and he says, I want to caution you about a mistake I was making. I was not integrating the work of Christ with the work of the Spirit adequately, and I don't want you to fall prey to that same mistake. And that was in a very, very decisive letter that I think that uh, Fletcher wrote Benson. And I, I think that uh, the holiness movement in general, the Western holiness movement in general, uh, has had that problem. And I think the Pentecostals inherited it from the Wesleyan Holiness Movement. Uh, the thing that Fletcher had emphasized was that uh, taking from what, I mean, what Fletcher had emphasized, taking it from Wesley, emphasis on circumcision of heart. Fletcher traces that back, you know, to Abraham. Uh, after he had been justified by faith, as Paul de describes it, as he believed God, that was what in Genesis uh, chapter 12, and then when you get to chapter 17, when Abraham was 99, he was 75 when he was justified by faith. When he was 99, the Lord came to Abraham and said, walk before me and be perfect. And uh, that was understood to be perfect in heart, not perfect in performance. We know that nobody is perfect in performance, but perfect and pure in heart. And it says in the self same day that the Lord told him to be perfect, the rite of circumcision was instituted as that particular mark of cleanness before God. And of course that became the theme of the prophets. Uh, that, you know, Jeremiah says, circumcise your hearts. That's what the Lord's interested in. And uh, so it becomes less circumcision and more cleansing of the heart. And, and when the prophets are expecting the latter days, they talk about the pouring out of the Spirit. They talk about sanctification. And when you, when you get to the book of Acts, and you get to Acts 2, and the pouring out of the Spirit, what really happened there? Uh, I think um, uh, sometimes we have focused too much on just the literal language of Acts 2 and not seen the whole history of salvation and the context of how that fits in with circumcision, circumcision of heart. And then, you know, when Peter stood before the Jerusalem Council, in uh, Acts 15, 8 and 9, talking about Cornelius, that their hearts were cleansed by faith or circumcised by faith because the word cleansing had come to replace the word circumcision. Your hearts were cleansed by the Holy Spirit even as ours was on the day of Pentecost. And, and that became a very strong focus in Fletcher, that the real purpose of Pentecost was to so clean up our life and clean up our hearts so there could be that intimacy with God. And, uh, and also, uh, we talked about this earlier in Romans 5, where Paul talked about, uh, and the love of God was poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and that word poured out is Pentecost language, uh, that that is really a significant thing about the meaning of Pentecost. And it's more than just water baptism. Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting, uh, you served on the Faith and, and uh, Order Council uh, Commission uh, when, they, when they talked about the new uh, baptismal liturgy. They introduced the pneumatological element to say, you know, that baptism is more than just water baptism, but it's the laying on of hands. It's being filled with the Spirit. It's being baptized with the Spirit. It's, it's both aspects, distinct but interrelated signified in the larger meaning of Christian baptism. And, uh, and, I, and I think our movement uh, uh, in, a, in its original days of the Western Holmes tradition in the, in the late 19th century and throughout much of the 20th century, and then our connection with Pentecostalism, that's been a danger to disconnect Pentecost from Easter and to disconnect uh, the work of the Spirit from the work of Christ. And I think our movements are, are, are mutual move, movements are really beginning to, uh, to address that issue and, and come to grips with it. 
Yeah, I'm right with you there. Uh, we, we fail to sometimes recognize that the book of Acts doesn't begin with Pentecost. It begins with the risen Christ teaching the disciples about the coming kingdom. Yep. Pentecost comes after that. And uh, it, is the ex it is the risen and exalted Christ who receives the Spirit from the Father and pours him out in Acts 2.33 and pours him out from the richness of his own life, death, and risen li resurrection. So, yeah, the Spirit definitely brings us on a Christophormistic path. Um, uh, a couple of things come to mind as I was listening to you. One is, uh, I think in terms of what we both share, one is this emphasis on the Spirit outpouring, that there is this turning point that takes place in the outpouring of the Spirit, that it is a gift. And yet at the same time, there's also this reaching for fullness, which um, also depicts ex key experiences, but also a process. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I was looking at, I was reading the book of Acts lately, and I was looking at this text in you know, Acts chapter 6, where it talks about the uh, choosing of the deacons. And it was describing the the qualifications that the deacons were to have. Mm -hmm. And one of them were, was that they were to be full of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, if being full of the Spirit was simply assumed at that time, that everyone has it, then why is it listed as a qualification for becoming a deacon? Yeah. Okay? <laughs> the, the fact that it's listed there seems to indicate that it's not something universally shared by the Christians. And then it occurred to me that in the book of Acts, Everyone has the Spirit, of course. Every, all believers have the Spirit. But there is this richness, this fullness to the, to the Spirit that the Christians are urged to, to yield to, to yearn for, um, and to experience. Now, our traditions have come to de define that differently. But I've come to wonder how different really is it. I mean. Uh, when you think about it, we're both striving for more of God. We're both striving for a life that is flourishing in the Spirit, that uh, displays um, signs of a life that is full of the Spirit and flourishing in the Spirit. We're both talking about how this has to be life transforming, how it has to be cleansing, how it has to be um, evidence of sanctification. Uh, Pentecostals would add the element of power and of witness, but I don't know of any Wesleyans who would denigrate that. No. So, uh, um, and, and, and my reading of the early Pentecostal literature is that they were not so much wanting to marginalize sanctification as speak of it in these other terms as well. well it, it, was, it was. You talk about sanctification just simply largely in terms of ethics. Yeah, that's it right. Very it does, doesn't it? it loses exactly. Its that's right. Exactly. It loses its dynamic. In fact, you wrote that at one point in a, a book. I seem to recall. Um, what was the title of that? Uh, something. That, fire was in the title. I forget. Pentecostal now. grace, maybe. Yeah, maybe that was it. Right. I can't recall now. But I yeah. seem to. Yeah. Re re I read something where you were saying that, and I agree with it very much. Uh, I see the Pentecostals historically. Uh, and I was mentioning earlier today, uh, when you read them in the heat of the polemics, you know, against the holiness folk, then you get that sharp separation between spirit baptism and sanctification. But when you're just listening to them talk about it, apart from the battle, when they're just like you and I are here speaking freely, they're talking about this in very Wesleyan terms. Sure. You know, it's a baptism in love. It's, it's uh, you know... Uh, and in fact, I came across several quotes in, when writing my book on the baptism of the Spirit where early Pentecostal authors talk about the fact, well, it's all holiness. It's all Jesus, you know, and it's so on. So uh, what are we talking about here with the Pentecostal revival? Or are we talking about something in addition to sanctification? I don't think so. I think we're talking about a way of expanding our appreciation for sanctification in the direction of this more dynamic, vocational, missional, kind of direction um, that, the sanctifi that the sanctified life is the outward moving life, that the spirit 
uh, who was it? Tillich said the coming within is the is the is the coming out. So the spirit that moves within moves us out. So the sanctified life is the life that is increasingly hospitable to the world, that opens a table of faith, that opens a table of gifts, that invites, that, that draws in. That, that's, that's what sanctification is. It's an outward moving reality. It's an empowering reality. And um, so I like to see the Pentecostals as accenting a, vo a vocational sanctification. Thank you.